G'day, everybody. Thanks for joining this broadcast today. Uh, my name is Chris Betcher. I'm the Program Manager for G Suite Adoption for the Google for Education team here in Sydney, Australia. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Steve. Kia ora, folks. I'm from New Zealand. My name's Steve. I'm the uh, Google for Education lead for New Zealand. Um, I'm an ex-geography teacher and social studies teacher in my uh, previous life, which was just the last year. So um, I've been using Google Earth for quite some time. So stoked to be bringing you some info about the amazing Google Earth. Yeah, fantastic. We're looking forward to it. And Steve and I actually, uh, there is a group within Google that's designed for teachers. It's called the Google Earth Education Experts Group. And um, Steve and I have been lucky enough to be part of that group um, pretty much since it started, Steve, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Went through a couple of iterations of names. I think there's about three or four different names we were involved with. But um, no, it's, a, it's a, a group of about, I think, about 100 educators around the world. Um, and yeah, when we get together, it's a, it's a great time. Steve, I'm going to get you to start off um, by just giving us a little intro to Google Earth. So I'll put, bring your screen up. Cool. Uh, right here. There you go. So. Um, awesome. Yeah. So I guess, you know, if, if we're all together in a room, I'll put, probably put, get, say, put your hands up if you've used uh, old Google Earth. So we call it old Google Earth now. The one you used to download to your computer and, it, um, you know, it took up a whole pile of space. And if, if you asked your, your network administrator at school to, to download it, they'd be, oh, but it takes up so much space and there's so much storage involved. So um, I guess about two and a half, three years ago now, they started talking about this new new version of Earth. So new Earth, I guess, is what we're talking about here. And um, it, the really cool thing about this is it's been converted to, to a web-based version of Earth with a lot of the stuff that was in the old one. Um, so we'll kind of talk about old Earth and new Earth, but realistically, we're going to focus on, uh, on New Earth, or Pretty Earth, sometimes they call it as well, as you can see from this picture that's there. So it's web-based, uh, which means if you have a web browser, you can use Earth. So the beauty of that is that it's accessible on pretty much anything. Um, and also, when you do stuff on Earth, you can share it with people because you have, um, you have a web address. Um, that you can share stuff with, which we'll touch on later on. So that, was, I, that, that is such a phenomenal thing, you know, that, that whole everything on Earth has a URL. Yeah. Every view, yeah, totally. every place, every, every altitude, like everything has a URL. Like it's yeah. phenomenal yeah. that you can now point directly to things. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, this this view that we're looking at at the moment, which has um, both New Zealand and Australia on it, um, you know, you could just grab the URL and flick it in an email or share it and go, hey, check this out. So, I mean, classroom-wise, if I wanted my students to look at something, I can zoom into whatever I'm at, grab the URL of that, um, share it, and they'll jump straight into it. So, really cool thing about the web-based version of Earth. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Steve, I might just bring my screen up over here. Uh, yeah, and cool. I might show people a couple of things about how you actually navigate your way around Earth because um, uh, it, it's uh, one of the thing, first things I used to teach my kids is just how to get around in Earth because once you can figure out how to get places, you can pretty much do anything at all. Oh, totally. um, so you've seen my screen there. And um, just if you move to the top of the screen, you'll notice that that address bar comes out. I'm in full screen mode at the moment, which is why when I move away, the uh, the bar goes away. But this is the address that Steve was talking about here. You, you see that everything has an address. And if I if I move the earth and I went back to that address, it's actually a different address. So every view has a URL. Which... Now, I just want to show you. Now, whether you're using a, uh, a desktop computer or a laptop computer, uh, it really doesn't matter. In fact, this works on a tablet. It works on a phone. You can get earth apps for all the major platforms. Um, I'm using a uh, laptop computer at the moment. We're using a Chromebook. Um, and I'm actually driving it with a mouse today. And here's my mouse here. and my mouse has a scroll wheel on it. One of the first things you need to learn about Earth is if you simply use the scroll wheel, you can zoom in and out. So all I'm doing is scrolling in and out. Now, if I didn't have a mouse, I could use my two fingers on any modern computer now, pretty much works on the idea that if you scroll with two fingers, uh, it will it will effectively zoom in and out as well. So that's with my two fingers on the trackpad. So zooming in and out is just simply a matter of either scrolling either on the trackpad or on the mouse. Uh, so that's technique number one. The second technique is click and drag. So if you are looking at uh, any view of the planet here, you can simply click with your mouse, drag, and we're simply panning the planet from left to right. If I zoom in further and do the same thing, I'm literally grabbing the ground and moving it underneath me to a new location. So that's the second navigation technique, click and drag to move around. The third thing is not really that obvious. And I don't know, Steve, if you've ever had anyone figure this out on their own, or generally people, until I tell them, they don't figure this out, is when you hold down the shift key, and let me just zoom in somewhere a little closer here, so let's, let's go down here, I don't know, down near Coffs Harbour somewhere here. It's a pretty, pretty part of the world. So we'll go down here to Walgulga in Coffs Harbour. If I hold down my shift key, 
And now I click and drag, you'll notice what happens if I click and drag upwards while holding shift, I'm tilting the earth. And if I click and drag sideways, I'm rotating the earth. Now, those techniques of being able to navigate your, your way around Earth by simply sort of using the scroll wheel to zoom in, using the click and drag to move, and then using the shift click and drag to rotate or pan or, sorry, or tilt, um, you, can, you can now view Earth from almost any location at all, any, any angle, any perspective, any altitude. Uh, so you can really see anything you like. Any thoughts on that, please? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, it's just such a cool way to, um, to be able to look and, and see perspective. And, like, if you just grab your scroll wheel and just zoom in on that point, Chris, you better see the, the amazing rock formations around the edge there. So, you know, you can actually zoom in and have a look at some really cool stuff like that because the imagery is just absolutely beautiful. And I think that, that nice idea of looking down on things is cool, but, yeah, when you flip it down and look across things, it gives you that nice idea of what's the local environment look like around this spot. So, yeah, it's a, it's a nice way to fly. Yeah, absolutely. Now, down in the bottom corner of Earth, down in the corner here, you'll notice there's some little buttons in the corner. And there's a few things that are worth knowing. The first uh, one, if I just work my way around from the top here, is this thing that looks like a target. If I click that and I allow my location services, you see I've got a little box. Oh, actually, it hasn't popped up for your screen, but there's a little box on my screen that's asking me to use my uh, location. And you can see that the little uh, target thing is spinning right now and it's trying... Uh, it's unable to get my location at the moment. What would normally happen if your if your network allows it is uh, it will take your location and it will zoom you in on your current location. Now, next to the little target down here, you've got this little person, affectionately known as Peg Man or Peg Non Gender Specific Person, as yeah. I most people like to call him or her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, if you click on Peg Man, you'll notice that depending on where you are in the world. You see I've got this little blue dots appeared just here and there's another blue dot just there and there's another blue dot just here. If I if I grab Pegman, I don't even have to grab Pegman, I can just click on the blue dot, but I'm in the habit of grabbing Pegman, dragging yeah. him or her to the blue dot, and now it takes me into what's called street view. And this is the 360 degree photography. And this is all through Google Earth, all over the place. And you'll notice that um, like this, if you look around very carefully here, you can actually see there's someone's shadow the here. Shadow, this yeah. Is actually, yeah, this is actually just some person who's got a 360 camera who happened to go to this location, took a photo and uploaded it to Google Earth. And so <laughs> there's his friend right there. So <laughs> uh, if I come back out of Photosphere by clicking the back button up the top there, you'll see it'll zoom me back out. Now, I'm out on some point out here near Woolgorga, but if I sort of zoom out to uh, somewhere where there's maybe some streets, maybe here, and now I click on Pegman, you'll notice all those blue lines appear. And those blue lines represent where we've had our street view vehicles drive around the country taking street view imagery. So whenever you see a blue line, generally that means that the Google car with the camera on the roof has been driving around and it's taken a bunch of imagery. And again, if I grab Pegman and drag Pegman to any location where there's a blue line, it will then take me and zoom me straight into that spot and show me what it looks like to stand right there. And of course, we all know, Steve, where's the first place that people go and look when they first get access to Google Earth? <laughs> well, yeah, you, know, you jump onto Google Earth and it's in high definition, so of course you go to your own house and exactly see what right. the whole house world, you get to literally, and you go to your house. <laughs> totally right. You notice down the bottom, you've also got this 3D and 2D button. So right now I'm looking at a two dimensional view of the world, a flat looking straight down perpendicular from above. If I click- Did you, the did you say there's the flat thing, Chris? What was that? Did you just say the Earth's flat there? No, that's it. <laughs> this particular view looks like it, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> so if I click the 3D button, what it does is it tilts the Earth on its side and sort of rotates it a little bit and actually puts it into a nice sort of gentle spin mm. just to, as a nice way to see it. Now, uh, I, I like I showed you before, you can hold down the shift button and click and drag to do that exact same thing. I don't know, that, that shift click thing, it's not actually documented anywhere. So unless someone tells you about it, it's one of those things a lot of people never discover. And I guess mm. that's why they put the 3D button in there, just so that you can, you know, for people who don't do the keyboard shortcut stuff, that they can just click that. But, you know, the real expert uses shift, drag. That's the way you do it. And yeah. finally, the thing you've got here is this little compass. And you'll notice the red arrow, the north point on the compass, is actually pointing sort of, you know, diagonally down. Um, that's telling me where, which way north is. If you click on that, it will automatically rotate and align things to north, what we call north up. 
Um, so yeah, so that's the little navigation down the bottom there. There's a plus and minus button in there for clicking in and out. But again, use your scroll wheel. That's the sort of the pro tip. And there's a little earth in the corner here. And you can actually pick up the little earth and rotate it. And it will actually zoom you around. So it's a bit of an acquired skill using the earth, the little earth thing here. But um, it is a way of sort of quickly navigating around the earth. You can just sort of, you notice when I drag that, it uh, draws an arrow and then it will drop me to wherever the arrow is uh, is landing. Mm. All right. So that's that's how you get yourself around in Google Earth. I'm going to hand back over to Steve now and he can tell you a little bit about map styles and some of the cool oh. settings you should think about. Hey, Chris, while we're just talking about navigating, if you just want to um, pop on the um, the pancake menu at the top, those three lines up top left. Up oh, these ones, yep. Yeah, and then go down to help. Yep. If you get on there, it's going to pop out that'll help. If you just type keyboard in there. Yeah. Oh, nice. It should give you a list of those. So the, I think the top one might be the keyboard shortcuts, is it? The keyboard shortcuts, the navigator. Yeah, there you go. So... Okay. um. If you're kind of forgetting the pro tips, and it's got um, it's got Windows, it's got uh, Chromebook, and it's got Mac controls in there as well. So if you kind of forget what they are, um, sometimes when I do like this sort of stuff, I'll grab that screenshot that and then just chuck it into a doc. So um, it's a nice little little tip there if you want to think about how to navigate yourself around. Awesome, fantastic, good yeah. tip. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring your screen up, Steve. There you are. You're uh, you're in charge now. All right, all right. So I'm driving again. Fantastic. So um. We're going to have a look at a few things down. And I just showed, um, got Chris to show you where those, those navigation, the pancake menu, some people call it, so it's those ones that slide outwards. Um, so we, we've got some settings in here. We can look at different map styles through here. Um, or if we're back on here also, we have um, some layers and styles down there. So if I have a look at this down here and click on my map style, um, this is how we can figure out what we're seeing on Earth. Uh, so if I go to that top one, which is clean, it kind of takes away everything pretty much. Now, there are a couple of different styles you can go through here. You can go everything, which is, I mean, if you if you want absolutely everything on there, hence the name. Um, if I just come over here, I'm going to use that scroll like Chris showed us. And if I just zoom in a little bit, see we're getting some roads happening. Scrolling even further, we're going to get all sorts of stuff popping up on here. So there's names, there's little features, the different ski fields that are on here. So that's how everything we can customize as well down there. Now, as we scroll down a bit further, we've got the 3D buildings, so we can switch those on and off. There is the animated clouds, which you saw when I started out. So I'm just going to zoom back out again. And as we zoom out, you'll see that the clouds pop up. Okay, so we can actually see what's happening. So that's, a, that's an animated view of the last 24 hours clouds. Now, it's really cool if you're teaching about weather and climate, because you can have a look at what's going on on the weather map, and then jump into here and have a look at those clouds. So if I drag that around a little bit, we can have a look at, you know, if you, if you hit up to Southeast Asia when they have the, um, the big weather systems coming in, you can track those. If we zoom over, head across Africa there, head up to the States, we can have a look at any big weather systems that happen to be, be coming. And we can see here is a really nice view of a tropical cyclone that's sitting out in the, in, the, in the ocean there. So those clouds are really cool. They're really helpful for having a look at what's actually going on up above us. I'm just going to switch those well, off. It, it, it's interesting because I know a lot of people who think the clouds on Google Earth is just like, oh, we just added some white stuff just to make it look <laughs> realistic. But it's actual real weather data coming yeah. from, um, from, I don't know, wherever we get that weather data from. It's the NOAA know. data, I think, yeah. NOAA it's the NOAA data, yeah. 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 And um, so, if you look at Google Earth, just like the normal view of Google Earth, and you see those clouds, you're looking at the animated version there now, right? But if you, even yeah. in the normal version of Earth where you just see the static clouds, I think that data is, it's what, no more than 20 minutes old, I believe? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so it's its, it's what's going on now. So really cool that um, it, it integrates a whole lot of data. And there is actually a, a data layer as well, which we can have a look at a little bit later on. So that's, um, that's the clouds. Now, for... Um, for, for geo teachers, I'm going to drop uh, a little interesting thing down there. If I switch on grid lines, it's going to pop the grid lines over the earth as well. I love it. So we have our tropics, we have our equator. So we can zoom around the equator and we can say, hey, look, it seems that these storms are all happening a lot around the equator. I wonder why that could be. So, you know, we can have a look at the clouds paired with those grid lines. Now, as we zoom in on the grid lines, you see the grid lines actually change as well and become much more fine in detail so we're looking at you know degrees north we zoom even closer in we're going to split that 
and we're going to go into our degrees, minutes, and then we can even zoom right in and go to seconds as well if we want to get really crazy on it. So those grid lines allow us to look at stuff and it bring that idea of latitude and longitude in. So if I zoom out again, there's our equator. So we talk about where would you love to go uh, as, as a geo teacher, of course, that's exactly where I'd love to go, where you're sitting in four different hemispheres in the same day be a pretty cool day so that's that's yeah that's the grid lines we can switch those off again as well i'm going to switch those clouds off but i'm going to leave those at 3d buildings on so that's in our map style through there if we pop that back in again go to our three lines our pancakes there is our settings so we can choose fly fly animation so whether you fly into somewhere or whether it just appears when you get to the end, you can choose how you have that view. So you saw before Chris had that orbital animation going on. So there's different sorts of animations you can choose. There's display settings. There's the case size you're going to have. You can have the format of how you're going to show things. So whether you want to have meters and kilometers or feet and miles. Latitude and longitude, same deal. Whoops, pop that down. Latitude, longitude, same deal. You can look at degrees, minutes, and seconds or decimals. So it could be a point if you want. Um, and then where am I? Yep, they've determined I'm in New Zealand. Fantastic. And clear all your search history. So that's your settings. Have a good play with those. Um, it's, it's the way that Earth looks. So you can change it ever so slightly. So that's kind of a real fast rip through the map styles. Have a good play with them um, because they are a nice way to change the things you're seeing. Nice. Cool. So Chris, do you want to have a, have a chat to us about... Um, about the search up there yeah, absolutely. let me bring my screen back up so there you go cool. um I, I love the fact that you've now got the uh the latitude and longitude lines that's showing that's so useful oh it really uh, is now the 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 easiest way to get around i think is just to sort of drag the earth around and navigate your way around but of course there are sometimes when you want to go to a specific place and of course that you know we're google we're pretty good at search there's a search <laughs> button up here so if you flick out the search tool on the side there uh so let's say i wanted to go to say london and I do that. You can see it brings up a couple of different Londons for me. If I click on London, UK, it's going to fly me around there. It brings up this little card on the side here. This is an information card, which we might talk a little bit more about later. But just remember these cards because in the next video, we're actually going to show you how to make these kind of cards as well. Yeah. Let me just uh, get rid of that for now and throw that in and, there. And I know when we were, when we were seeing this um, right back at the beginning, it was, as, a, as a bunch of geo teachers, it was like, hey, this stuff's cool, but how can we make stuff? So that's going to be part two isn't it yeah absolutely now i think in your settings there i think i've turned oh i'm going to turn everything back on again oh that that gets really busy with everything on doesn't it sure maybe, does, I'll, yeah. maybe i'll turn it to exploration mode there you go <laughs> that's, that's probably a good thing all right so because i typed in london it's finding me the greater london area and of course i can now use those navigation tips i mentioned before i can use my mouse to zoom in on stuff and you can go in. So searching for something, you just type it into the box and go there. The more specific you go, the better. If I'd have typed in, you know, the Tate Gallery London, it would have taken me straight there rather than just to the you know, London as, as a city. One of the things I want to point out to you, though, when we get in this close, um, and that is we use a technique here at Google called photogrammetry. And basically it involves flying aircraft over the land. So as you know, a lot of this imagery comes from satellites, which are, you know, quite high up. But we also now are flying airplanes over the land stacked with cameras that take photos from multiple angles. And then we feed all those photographs into a machine learning al algorithm and it figures out three dimensionally what is on the ground underneath it. So you'll notice if I go in here to uh, let's go this in the city of London here and I zoom in a little bit there. If I use that technique that I showed you before, where I hold down the shift key and rotate the earth or tilt the earth, you'll notice that all these buildings here are actually three dimensional. And you can see if I zoom in there, this is not just a photographic satellite image of London. This is a full 360, uh, sorry, 360 degree 3D you know, extravaganza of information that's going on here. Uh, and although we now we can only create this 3D imagery in places where we've been able to do this photogrammetry technique. In other words, places where we've been able to fly over the country uh, and take these photos so that the machine can stitch it together into these 3D images. So there's lots of places in the world where we obviously haven't done that yet. We've um, we've captured a lot of the major cities in the world, a lot of the major landmarks, so places like Yosemite National Park, for example, or um, uh, uh, the Grand Canyon, like those sorts of places which are, um, you know, three-dimensionally three, three interesting, if I can use that term. 
But so that's how, you, that's how you get both sides of buildings, isn't it? So when they fly over, they can see one side in the top and the other side. So yeah, that's, that's really, let's just, there's a great example of this. Let's just go to uh, Eiffel Tower. This is a good example I normally use when I try and show this. So if I type in there Eiffel Tower, you see it'll fly me directly across the channel there, straight into Paris and straight down to the Eiffel Tower, and there it is right there. Now, this technique of building these 3D models is really interesting, and there's a great video about it, which we'll include as a link. Um, but you can imagine if you were flying an aircraft over this Eiffel Tower, as you approach it, that's what you'd see, right? And then mm -hmm. as you got closer to the tower, you'd start to, as you flew over it, you'd start to see a different view of it. You'd see it like that. And as you continue to fly past it, and that's a bit hard to do, I might have to turn this around. But as you imagine, as, you, as you're leaving the other side of the tower, you're going to see, obviously, the other side of the tower. And so what happens is as these aircraft fly over all these landmarks and they're actually seeing all these different perspectives, but it's all been geotagged with locations from GPS data and so on and so on, the computer's able to figure out, oh, that side of that building belongs to that side of the building. So it just assembles it into a 3D model. It's really clever the way it does that. Now, I just yeah. want to show you the, if I fly down here to, uh, there's a place in Sydney called Piermont. Piermont, New South Wales. So I'll just type that in the search here. It'll fly me from London down to Piermont, just, uh, which is obviously just outside Sydney, for those that know it. And why I think Piermont is kind of an interesting place, uh, other than the fact that it's where the Google office is, is you and see you here. Can see, we can see the roof of the Google office looks pretty cool you as well. You can see the roof of the Google office. It is right, uh, where is it? Um, now, now I've lost it, Steve. <laughs> there. That, that one there with the uh, Aboriginal design on the roof. Yeah, that's cool, though. Building in Sydney. Um, but the, what I wanted to show you here is, you notice if I go over this side of the city and I tilt and rotate around, you can see I've got the full three-dimensional 3D version of Sydney. But if I come a little bit further over onto this side, you'll notice as soon as I cross the side here, this is now back to being flat imagery again. All these houses over here are not 3D. They're just the static satellite imagery taken mm -hmm. perpendicular from above. And one of the reasons for that, if I just zoom out a little bit, is you'll notice, and those of you who know Sydney, notice that there's an airport just down here. This is Sydney Airport. And so this is a flight path coming in here. Because of the technique of photogrammetry involves flying an aircraft over the ground to take these imagery, um, obviously, if we're in a flight path, that's a really difficult thing to do. I would imagine right now, Steve, we're probably making the most of this with, with there's not a lot of planes flying because of COVID. But, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I haven't heard that, but I imagine if we're smart, we should be doing that. Anyway, so that's how the 3D imagery is created, and that's how the search feature there works in Google Earth. So you can basically fly to anywhere and then zoom down to it and see the 3D version. And, of course, you know, if you want more than the 3D version, don't forget we've got our friendly Pegman over here, and every time I click Pegman, there's all the different views I could go to. So, really, I can explore the Earth in all kinds of ways. Mm. Um, uh one of the uh, little buttons on the side here I find, think is interesting. It looks like a little dice on the side here. And if you click the dice, what it does is it basically picks a random location and flies you there, <laughs> just like where are we now? We've gone to Manchester, the home theatre in Manchester. If I click that dice again, it's going to zoom me out. It's going to fly me somewhere else. And where are we going? Tiatia, a volcano in Asia. Fantastic. There you go. That, you, that could, could not have gone any better. <laughs> Absolutely. And like, I, you might ask yourself, well, what, what, other than a curiosity, what's the advantage of that? Well, there's two examples I always talk about with this. Is one is, um, you know, I have a friend who teaches not far from Steve down there in Auckland who um, uses this to do a project every year with his students where he gets them to plan a trip somewhere. And so he gets the kids to choose somewhere in the world they'd like to go and they have to work out the budget for the travel and the accommodation, and the flights and everything else. He's now changed that assignment into click that button three times and that's the trip you have to plan for, which yeah. I love that. I love that element of randomness about that. And the other use I've seen, um, a kindergarten teacher actually used that button. And every morning when the kids come and sit on the mat at the start of the day, she gets them all gathered around the front of the class there and she clicks that button in Google Earth and they fly somewhere and they just look at it and they just spend 30 seconds to a minute just looking at it, having a quick you know, explore, maybe asking a couple of questions, and then they get on with their day. And by the time that class of kindergarten kids has gone through the school year, they've looked at probably 200 different places in the world. And I reckon that's a pretty good way to expand their perspective, don't you? 
Oh, definitely. I mean, and people kind of say, you know, how many different places are there? And there's, I think there's 15 or 20,000 places in, in that, that dice, and they're, they expand them all the time. I don't wow. think I've ever been to the same place twice. Yeah. Uh, yeah so you can kind of keep going. Yeah. You can basically make your own amazing race just by clicking it a couple of times and how are you going to get there? It's, it's yeah. great fun. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, I actually heard a, um, one of our colleagues talking talking about um, in English classes, they can use this and zoom in and you know, drop into a place and go, yeah, what is it? What does it see? What does it sound like? What what does it smell like being here? What could you see? What could you hear? So it's another really cool way of using Earth as um, you know this multimedia type of display idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Steve, I'm going to give you your screen back there. So now that's your screen showing again, um, and right. I'm going to get you to tell us about the way rulers and measurement work in Earth. Cool, cool, cool. So. I've just um, jumped into Waikiki here, so you can see up on the top right is that knowledge card there. Um, and if I say to myself, "Look, you know, here, this is the Big Island of Hawaii," um, you know, down at the bottom here is where, the, where all the volcanic activity is. I'm lucky enough to to have taken a, a school trip here a couple of times, and we can cruise down here. And this is where you go. The the lava's hitting the water, and the steam's coming out, and and the the land is actually advancing this way. And so this is called the Big Island of Hawaii. And the kids like, "Well, why is it called the Big Island?" Well, it's like, "Well, so." It's, it's big, obviously. So <laughs> let's let's try and get a little bit more specific than it's big. So How big is it, Steve? <laughs> that's a great question, Chris. And if you let me show you, here's how we can do it. <laughs> so we can click on the on the ruler here, and it will. If we go from the top, from the top, that's a great geographical term, isn't it? I used to tell my kids I'd, I'd hurt them a lot if they said top. So if we go from the north point here, we head down to the south shore, down to Pahoa, where the um, where the lava's hitting the the water and we click on that that is going to give us a distance up here of 126.4 kilometers so we get a nice straight line distance but then if we decide to start a new one that we actually want to do maybe some area perhaps what we can do is we can click around the outside of the island and i'm going to just mainly for uh for time constraints i'm going to do this you really purposes? <laughs> yeah yeah I know that some people are going to go, you're missing a hold of points. Yes, I am. That's exactly true. But we'll do this quickly. So we jump around and we get to the end here. Now, if we close that shape up, it's going to give us the area as well. So it gives us the perimeter and it gives us the area as well as being able to do a straight line distance. Nice. So and all you did is go click, 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 click around the perimeter. Yeah. And then yeah. Just yeah just totally. So if we go, look, the big iron is 10,000 square kilometers. And then I'll just cruise up here a bit further and let's go to the main island of oahu so here we are here if we go start new we'll start at the top we'll head down past jurassic park because that's where that was filmed then we'll pop down to where the karate kid was filmed down here then we'll pop down to 51st dates down there then joe versus the volcano then uh, they filmed pearl harbor in there because uh, that's where pearl harbor was uh, and then we go up there up there up there up there and we close that up and say, so, look, that's only 1,600 square kilometers. So we can say that, you know, it is a, a much bigger island. So it's a really cool way to do perimeter and a really cool way to do area. Now, if I just click out of there, I'm going to start new again. So from north, the North Shore, down to kind of the southern tip there is 56.45 kilometers. Now, if we wanted to have a look at some other ways of measuring, drop it down. It gives us a how we want to measure it so centimeters which obviously we don't want to measure in centimeters because that's ridiculous but we can if we want so we can choose all sorts of different ways we can also do inches we can go it's two million two hundred and twenty thousand inches if we want um we can do nautical miles we can talk about discussions of that as well 30.48 nautical miles which is different than a regular mile apparently um there we go and also down the bottom we can measure in smoots so that is thirty three thousand one hundred and sixty nine smoots <laughs> uh, so a smoot is an area of measurement named after a guy called smoot um nobody has any idea why this measurement is in here it was a, a little uh, a little bit of a laugh by the by the earth team but basically smoot was a, a college student in the states and for a stunt they used him to measure the distance across a bridge and it was a certain number of smoots and um weird little fact now that on the bridge where um where they used smoot to measure they now have tiles that are exactly one smoot in length. So, <laughs> there you go. so 
So if anyone pops out uh, that question about what a smoot is, have a look. It's a, it's a great little, it's a fantastic little piece of trivia as well to use. So you can measure in smoots as well if you want. So uh, measurement tool. Tom Cruise's. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. So that's the, that's the measurement tool. It's a really, really handy tool. And again, it's one of those things that, you know, when we were, were over there, it's a bunch of teachers, they said, oh, we're going to put a ruler on here. We all went, oh, oh, my goodness, a ruler. That's so fantastic. So measurement tool, absolutely brilliant. Uh, down there. Yeah, that's lots of good things you can do with that measuring tool. I mean, I've oh. seen people, like, plan out, you know, half marathon courses in their local area or um, – totally. uh, you do trigonometry with it, measure the length of shadows in the map, and figure out how tall things are. Some really oh, interesting sure. work you can do with that. Sure. And I mean, uh, one other real quick thing you do is if you're measuring um, scale, um, then what you can do is I'm just going to jump into a school here. So if you're measuring scale, what you could do is you go outside, you know, measure how big something is that you have access to. So say here's a here's a rugby field. Um, if I grab the measurement tool there, we can do that. That's the length of it. It's 78 smoots. Let's change that back to <laughs> let's change that back to, to meters, perhaps. We could do that. And then you can go out and measure it. Measure it on here, see how big it is, and you can figure out that idea of scale and distance. So you can say this is actually at this scale. So lots of cool things you can do with, with scale. Measure something you actually know, measure something on a map, figure out what the scale is. Good times. Uh, oh, that's awesome, Steve. That measurement tool is really fantastic. So much cool stuff you can do with that. Hey, listen, I just want to finish up here by just showing people the Voyagers tool inside Earth, which I think is actually yeah. the coolest thing of all. And it's this little pirate steering wheel here. I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, the yep. pirate steering wheel yep. says Voyager. And if I click on that, you'll notice it opens up. And there's this whole, I don't know how to describe this to, except to say it's like a giant multimedia geographic textbook inside Google Earth. Right? It's that got all pretty good. Yep. It sounds yeah. pretty good. It's all these stories and explorations and voyages of places around the earth that are told through maps and pictures and stories and videos. And so as you can see, if I go down here, if I scroll down here, we can explore like the wildlife of Africa or bald eagles or, you know, the raptors of Montana or Mars on earth. There are all these different things here, but there's categories. So you can go to sort of uh, like, I don't know why Portugal's there today, but if I go to say culture, <laughs> it's one of my favorite areas here. If I go into culture... That'll load up here. You can see discoveries made in Google Earth. Here's the whole thing on Hanukkah. Um, holiday foods around the world. Well, that sounds interesting. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, and so, those, those, those change as well. So, you know, when it's Halloween yeah. time, Halloween will pop up. When it's Christmas time, there'll be Christmas ones. So there's all that sort of cool stuff. It's All the stuff is changing. So every time you go back to those, you might see something different. Yeah. So, so when you come in here, so the way these work, basically, essentially, you'll get a welcome screen, like what you're seeing here, and a Start Exploring button. When you start exploring, what it will do generally is on the left-hand side of the screen, it will use Google Earth to fly you into somewhere in the world that it's trying to show you. And over on the right-hand side, it will bring up a panel. And the panel generally is structured the same way most of the time. It's got an image or a picture or a video or something at the top. And it's got a section down the bottom here where it has some information. And down here, you can see this is one of 13. So there are 13 different points of interest in this particular tour. Uh, and if I scroll through here, it will take me to the next one here. So this is telling me about a tortière, is a Quebecois meat pie. Oh, nice. And, of course, it's flown us into Quebec here, Quebec City. Uh, there's the uh, famous hotel right there down, down the harbour. But if I click to the next one, it will then take me to the next holiday food that it wants to talk to me about. And this is about Israel's Sufganiyot. Man, every time I come to Google Earth, I learn something new that I didn't know before. Yeah. So this is about an Israeli traditional food, holiday food, and, it, of course, it flies me into Israel so I can learn a little bit about the food, see an image up here, learn whereabouts it's from, and so on and so on. So that's kind of a good example of what a, a voyage is. It's an exploration of an idea or a concept using Google Earth uh, and some information to tell a story. Now, speaking of telling stories, if I just go uh, come back out of here, I'll use that back button, I go in here, you'll see there's a whole bunch of stories here. So here's a story about the fall of the Berlin Wall. Here's a thing about celebrating Indigenous cultures. This is looking at Mayan ruins. Like, my brain just explodes every time I come in here because there's always something to learn. There's always something new in here. Um, yeah, we, whenever, I, whenever I show people this, I'm like, look, if you haven't been into Voyager before, put aside a couple of hours, to be honest, because yeah, right. 
find stuff and find stuff and find stuff. And we we're talking before about um about the URL. So yep. each one of these voyages has their own URL as well. Right. So if you find one you really love, you can just grab that URL and, and, and bookmark it or flick it out via Google Classroom, you know? Yeah, that's I was gonna say because it's got a URL, you can just drop it straight into classroom and, and say to kids, go and look at this. Yeah, totally. It's so much more interesting than saying turn to chapter seven in your textbook and read <laughs> read the next three pages. Is you say you say click go to Google Earth via classroom, click on that link, and then go and explore this idea through this amazing three-dimensional multimedia story that's being told. Oh, for sure, for sure. That's pretty cool. Now, um, have you got any favourites here? Um, no, I'm, uh, it's, it's hard. I mean, well, one of my favourites is actually, um, if we go, we go into the games tab. Oh, uh, well, hang on. Just while we, you, I think you oh, mentioned yeah, it, well, this is school. This is a neat oh, one. This is cool. Sorry, yeah, that one's amazing. Yeah, just so, looking at you like really this. Cool. Yeah, if you click on this one, this is school. And all I did was browse to it there to find it. Mm. You, again, it's got an introduction screen. We hit the Start Exploring button. It brings up the panel on the side here, and it's flying me into the Satyamurti Nagar Government School in India. And so it flies me in there. But not only does it fly me in there, now it takes me into the Street View image, and I'm standing inside this classroom yeah. of, of these Indian students. And I can read a little bit about it here, learn how the school was named, and so on and so on. If I click on the next button here, it'll fly me to the next place. So this is going to take me to the Sri Thame Lower Secondary School in Kumbu, Nepal, which, wow. like, I wouldn't have thought to go to. So that's why it's yeah. called Voyages, because it, it takes you on these amazing voyages of discovery to learn things that you might not have learned otherwise. And so I'm now standing in this uh, Nepali uh, wow. schoolhouse, just like that. And getting kids, getting kids to expand their thinking about their world, you know, like I could not take an excursion here. I know you were lucky no. enough to go to Hawaii before. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm probably not going to take a group of kids to Nepal, but I can take them virtually. And I think that I, that that's the strength of Google Earth to me, the, this okay. ability to explore your world without leaving your classroom. Oh, for sure, for sure. And, you know, you, you, there's so many great things you can look at in Voyager. And as I say before, you know, put aside a couple of hours because there's there's some stuff that that's ranked but so there, there are um the different um types of voyages when you scroll up um which are linked really really nicely so there's um there's the nature ones there's the games yeah. ones there's different yeah. layers as well and, and if you look at the layers watching this right now steve that are old enough to remember uh come san diego yeah well that that's come in san diego right it's the game you can play and it, it's old school it's got old school graphics uh, yeah, that's really cool. really cool. Yeah, um, um, and some of these too are also integrating quizzes. So some of these yeah. explorations will take you somewhere and then pause and ask you a question to see, you know, try and teach you things along the way um, mm. by asking simple questions. And the other thing that's in here, I think, is the layers tab, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Um, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, sure. So the um, the layers tab has a bunch of different layers of data put on it, um, and there's some really really fantastic ones. So that one, uh, the ten thousand years of volcanoes one, is pretty cool. Uh, yep. It shows you different information about about the volcano. So what they've, what they've done is they've basically got data from um, from partners of Google's and brought it onto the map. And I think the great thing about um, about these Voyager stories is that it's showing things spatially. So you get that real nice spatial awareness of actually what's going on and where these things are happening. And you know you've got a whole lot of points of of, da of, uh, of data about volcanoes on this weird line. I wonder what that could be about. So. You know, it shows the stories, it brings the data in, but it also shows it on Earth, on a map, which yeah. I think for me is absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. Uh, I, th there's, there's no comparison between allowing students to learn about their planet using this versus looking at just like a flat atlas or a yeah. map on yeah. the wall where, yeah. you know, you're dealing with the Mercator problem and everything else. Like just totally. this, is, yeah. this is legit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And um, and there is a tab in, in the voyage as well, tagged as education. So if you want to, um, if, if you're thinking about, I want to have a look at some education things, you can click in there. And there's some really fantastic stories in there. One of my favourites in there is um, about the Underground Railroad. So it looks at the 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 the, the way the slaves took from um, from USA up into Canada via the Underground Railroad. So it's a really cool story. Again, showing where things happened. Um, so it's just the beauty of the fact that, you know, as a geo teacher, I love it because it's, it's on a map, you know, you look actually looking at the world yeah. with these really cool stories. Yeah. It's an awesome tool. 
Yeah. Steve, the question every teacher asks me whenever I show them Voyagers is, how can I make my own? Mm, totally. That was the question we asked when I first saw them as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, luckily, we're going to make a part two video to this, and we're going to take you all the way through the process of how you actually make your own Voyagers. And so you've seen a few examples here. There's tons to explore. Just go to the pirate steering wheel and, and mm -hmm, set aside mm -hmm. a couple of hours. Um, yeah. But uh, we're going to show you in the next video how you actually make them for your own self and get and your kids also to make how, Yeah, how your students can make them. Because again, you know, if we think about giving our kids the ability to, to produce stuff, they're becoming creators of content, not just consumers of content. Because this is some beautiful consumption going on here. But we want our kids to be creators and show yeah. their passions and show their stories. And so that's what we're going to have a look at in, um, in part two. Yep. So come awesome. back and see more. See you guys in part two. Awesome.